by increasing their student loan rates because of politics. This is a common sense idea, extend the student loan, uh, loan low interest rate, and we should do it today. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. I just note, Mr. Speaker, that it was common sense uh, about two weeks ago when almost the entire Republican Party voted to let the rates go to 6.8 percent. It's nice to see that they've uh, found some reality here. This time I'd like to yield one minute to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Hoyer. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman for yielding and following up on my friend from Texas. I served on the Labor Health Committee for 23 years. Bill Natcher from Kentucky used to say this, if you take care of the health of your people, and invest in the education of your young people, you'll continue to be the strongest and best nation on the face of the earth. I agreed with the gentleman from Kentucky then, and I agree with him now. Everybody says on this floor, although everybody didn't vote that way, Mr. Boehner voted against this reduction in interest rates, Mr. Cantor voted against this reduction in interest rates, and Mr. Klein voted in 2007 against this reduction in interest rates. What we are saying is we need to invest we talk about subsidies. This isn't a subsidy. This is an investment in a better, stronger, more growing America. That's what this is. But what do we say? Natcher said, remember, if we take care of the health of our people, this undermines the health of our people. It takes away preventive assistance so that women, families, children can get preventive care, which so many Republicans have said is a more efficient and effective cost-saving way to address the health of our country. Bill Natcher was right. Bill Natcher was right. Conservative Repu uh, Democrat from Kentucky who said, if you take care of the health of your people and educate your young people, you will be the strongest nation on earth. This bill goes in the wrong direction trying to do the right thing. Let us reject this bill, and if in fact you are for investing in our young people and bringing these interest rates down, which is so absolutely essential, then bring back a bill you know will pass, because you know this bill will not pass. The President has issued a, a uh, statement of administration policy, says they will veto this bill because they do not want to undermine the health of women, family, and children, while at the same time they want to invest in the college education for our country's young people and our future. Reject this bill, bring back a, a, a new bill, the Courtney bill, which does in fact invest in our children and take care of the health of our people. Gentlemen's and time I is back expired. the balance of my time. Gentlelady from Illinois. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, as we've noted before, in February, Congress took action to, uh, to stop a payroll tax increase on millions of working families and to ensure that the tax increase did not add to the deficit. The legislation cut $5 billion from the uh, uh, prevention, uh, prevention Fund. And the bill received the support of 149 House Democrats, including uh, uh, Democrat leaders such as uh, um, Mrs. Pelosi, and uh, Mr. Kildee and Mr. Courtney. I guess that the Democrats were in favor of, of uh, raiding the, the slush fund before they were against it. And with that, I would like to uh, yield uh, two minutes to the uh, gentlelady from Alabama, uh, Ms. Roby. Gentlelady from Alabama the is recognized Committee. for two minutes. Thank you so much. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in support of H.R. 4628, the Interest Rate Reduction Act. And um, I have a nice prepared speech, but in sitting here listening to the debate, I really want to focus in on one specific issue. I mean, American students should not be fearful to attend college due to the crushing weight of student loans weighing them down after their graduation. But as is suggested by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, that this preventative care fund uh, reduction would deny access to individuals for these health care screenings. And I had the privilege, Mr. Speaker, just yesterday to have a conversation uh, with the Secretary uh, Sebelius directly as it relates to this fund. And I asked her very specifically, Madam Secretary, will the reduction in the preventative fund cause a child to be denied? not access to a health screening, and by her own admission, she said, and I quote, absolutely not. 
So as I listen to this debate and I hear the comments from my friends on the other side of the aisle, I'm actually dismayed to hear some of the things that are being said that, quite frankly, by the Secretary's own admission, just quite are not true. And so I stand today in support of this bill, and, uh, and, and I want to also point out that by the Secretary's own admission as well, she acknowledged that, in fact, the President of the United States himself, in his own budget, put reductions uh, to this fund. Uh, the Interest Rates Reduction Act will repeal um, this slush fund. The $5.9 billion will be used to offset the cost of maintaining the one-year extension as we move towards a meaningful response. Uh, to our, our young people. Uh, Congress must push, put Washington politics aside and take action. And it is time to stop piecing together temporary solutions to the problems that exist in our student aid programs. I fully support the Interest Rate Reduction Act, and I encourage my colleagues to join me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I yield back the remainder of my time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you. And, Mr. Speaker, I note that I was at that uh, Education Committee meeting and heard the Secretary say very quite clearly that no child who gets an immunization under this program will get an immunization under this program if the fund is eliminated. And, Ms. Biggert, of course, uh, analyzing taking a little bit of the money and equating that with taking and wiping out the entire fund. Uh, with that said, Mr. Speaker, I yield two minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. The gentleman from California is recognized for two minutes. I thank the gentleman for yielding. The cynicism of the debate today is why Congress is held in such low repute. We hear Republicans saying that a public health fund is a slush fund. This is a fund set up to keep us healthy, prevent diseases as long as possible, immunize our kids, provide mammography and pap smears, services to women in need to find birth defects early on to help stop smoking, and they call this a slush fund. They're not trying to reduce this fund. Their proposal is to eliminate it. And the argument from the other side of the aisle is, well, that we'll still get those services. I don't know where we're going to get those services if the fund is eliminated and appropriations are being squeezed down. So they call this a slush fund, but they are using it as a slush fund because they took the elimination of this fund to pay for this extension of student loan interest rates, and then they eliminated this fund so they could use it for their reconciliation to the budget in order to make sure defense is adequately funded, to make sure that their tax cuts are kept in place. They're using it as a slush fund, and they're using the student loan issue to drive their agenda. I find that very cynical. I find that, in fact, quite repulsive. And I hope we will reject this bill. We're all for, according to the debate, making sure that we maintain the current interest rate for the 7.4 million students depending on these loans. But I don't find much sincerity when we see a proposal coming from the Republican majority to pay for that by cutting out preventive services. There's got to be a better way to do it. They're not looking for a better way. They're just looking for a way to cover their rear ends. I urge people to vote against this bill. You're back to balance of my time. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I would uh, uh, yield three minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. The gentleman from Florida is recognized for three minutes. I, I, I thank my distinguished colleague. And let me just say to the gentleman from California, who's just getting ready to leave the floor, when he mentioned that Republicans are going to prevent tobacco prevention of our youth today, he and I both know there's a separate program in CDC just for uh, tobacco prevention. And in fact, in this so-called PPHF, which uh, all of us have uh, called a slush fund, which is the Prevention of Public Health Fund, there is right now $191.685 million for this spending for tobacco prevention. And after this amendment passed, there would be $109 million still remaining in this for that smoking and health component of CDC. So I say to the, Massachusetts, to the gentleman from Massachusetts and Mr. Hoyer from Maryland, I mean, you're, you're yelling fire and there's no fire. I mean, I can go through all these things to show you 
that your arguments are wrong. And the fact that Sebelius, the head of the Health and Human Services, has said publicly, as the gentle lady from Alabama so eloquently pointed out, she in fact pointed out that this so-called slush fund is not going to impact what Mr. Hoyer says, dealing with women and families and children, and they bring up Mr. Hatcher. Well, Mr. Hatcher says it's very noble, very good, and you constantly use that. But I'm just going to take you through these different areas where you say that it's going to be unable to provide supports for the family and women and children. Cancer prevention and control, which includes breast and cervical cancer screening. It's funded at $205 million in the FY 2012 budget. In FY 2013 budget, it goes up to $261 million. It goes up almost $60 million. No prevention funds are being used for free cancer screening, and they will not be affected. Let's take birth defects and developmental disabilities. In FY 2012, the CDD birth defect program was $138 million. It's now going to be $125 million. Again, these funds would continue to receive discretionary funding, nutrition, physical activity, and obesity activities. Again, will continue to receive funding. Viral hepatitis screening, CDC health care statistics and surveillance, and lastly, Prevention Research Center. All of these things, I say to the folks on this side, are going to continue to receive base discretionary funding. And I, I challenge you, the gentleman from Massachusetts, to point out where in what each of the ones I've talked about all these programs are going to remain in existence. So how in the world can you come down the floor and constantly say, we're going to cut down. I'm almost ready to, 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 but the point is that you folks are not accurately portraying what this bill does. So I support H.R. 4628, and I agree with uh, Secretary Sebelius. The slush fund will not affect women, family, and children. Gentlemen, time has expired. Members are reminded to address their remarks to the chair and not to others in the uh, second person. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would have addressed my remarks to the chair and taken the challenge if it had been anything other than an empty challenge and would have noted that uh, Secretary Sebelius and the administration know clearly that those funds would have been diminished and that thousands of screenings for breast cancer and cervical cancer would have been passed by hundreds of thousands in the administration's own analysis on that. And with that, I ask the chair for the time remaining for both sides, please. Uh, the gentleman has uh, 13 minutes remaining, uh, and the gentlelady from Illinois has five and three-quarter minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With that, I uh, yield one minute to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. The gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman, who is a pleasure to work with on the Education Committee. Think of the great moments of American public policy, creation of land-grant colleges, the GI Bill, providing student loans, all directed toward increasing access to higher education. Four years ago, we, the Democrats, lowered interest rates for students to 3.4 percent, saving today's typical student borrower a couple thousand dollars. So two, do it, two days ago, the speaker, cornered by student outrage, says, well, the majority always intended to keep these rates low. Well, let's see, Republicans really cared about keeping student interest rates low. Why did their budget double those rates? They voted twice this year clearly, explicitly, twice, to let rates double and collect $166 billion more from students so they could preserve tax giveaways for big oil. Now they come and propose canceling preventive health care funding, not preventing cervical cancer, not preventing tobacco-related diseases, not preventing type 2 diabetes, eviscerating the Centers for Disease Control to preserve tax giveaways for big oil. Illinois. I reserve the reserve. Gentlelady from Illinois reserves her time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lee. Gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. Thank you very much. First, let me uh, thank Congressman Tierney for, for yielding and for your tireless leadership on this important issue. It's clear to me that Republicans are not serious about addressing the student loan interest rate hikes with this so-called Interest Rate um, Reduction Act. Their bill is a wolf in sheep's clothing and would permanently end the Prevention and Public Health Fund established by the Affordable Care Act. This prevention fund is the first mandatory funding stream dedicated to improving public health. 
It is extremely important in our fight to prevent chronic diseases, HIV and AIDS, and women's health. This is such a sad and sinister ploy. Instead of pitting student loan relief for middle and low income families against critical preventive health services for middle and low income families, we should be working toward real solutions. Instead of paying for subsidies to big oil, we should invest in our students who are our future. This bill jeopardizes, mind you, jeopardizes the health of our nation. It uses our students as pawns, and it is morally wrong. I hope we defeat this insincere proposal. Gentlelady from Illinois. I reserve the time. Gentlelady continues to reserve. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. DeLora. Gentlelady from Connecticut is recognized for two minutes. The Republican majority in this House is involved in a political shell game on this issue. They have voted to eliminate the Prevention and Public Health Fund. They voted two days ago to end it. Today they want to tell you they were going to take money from it to pay for student loans. You can't end the fund and then talk about taking money to use it. In addition to that, the gentleman from California a moment ago talked about money in the appropriations bills for these health care programs. What he doesn't tell you that the majority in the committees are voting to cut the money for the Centers for Disease Control, for the uh, uh, screenings for breast and cervical cancer, for all of these efforts. They are talking out of both sides of their mouth. This majority passed a budget that has asked families to pay for tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, slash Pell Grants for nearly 10 million college students, allow interest rates on student loans to, to double in July. And after there was an outpouring of concern about the doubling of interest rates, they switched course. This apparent moment of conscience was too good to be true. Instead of ending oil subsidies, closing corporate tax loopholes, what they now have done, they eliminate, eliminate the Prevention and Public Health Fund. What that fund does is crucial health services to all Americans, including women and children. Women, I'll be brief in this. It is about providing screenings for breast and cervical cancer. My friends, 4,000 women die every year from cervical cancer. Isn't it worth trying to prevent cervical cancer and not eliminate it? It works to prevent coronary heart disease, the leading killer of women in America. It has the potential to mitigate osteoporosis arthritis, mental illness, all conditions would disproportionately affect the women in this nation. This fund is about the giving of life. There is a level of hypocrisy on this floor that is staggering. Instead of taking the money from health care for education, a false choice, vote against this bill. Gentlelady's time has expired. Gentlelady from Illinois. I reserve the time. Gentlelady reserves. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, at this time I'd like to yield one and a half minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Levin. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one and one half minutes. Without objection. The Republicans have taken a 180 degree turn on helping with student loans. The Republican budget said no. And in February, Governor Mitt Romney said this. The right course for America is to make sure that we provide loans to the extent we possibly can at an interest rate that doesn't have the taxpayers having to subsidize people who want to go to college, who want to go to school. Now he and the Republicans here have shifted. Shifty indeed. How they are doing so is not only politically expedient, but extremely harmful. They hit health care. Health care. They refused to end a tax break for big oil that never should have been given in the first place, even though the big five oil companies made then more than $32 billion in the fourth quarter of last year alone. This bill is shameless. It is shameful. Vote no. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Does the gentlelady from Illinois continue to reserve? Yes, I continue to reserve. Gentleman from Massachusetts. 
Mr. Speaker, at this time, I'd like to yield one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Woolsey. The gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, in my dictionary, a slush fund is defined as a fund for bribing public officials or carrying on corruptive propaganda. Yet the Speaker of the House used that term. The chair of the Education and uh, Labor Committee used that term slush fund to describe the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which saves lives by paying for childhood immunizations and screenings for cervical cancer and birth defects. We are the wealthiest and most powerful nation in the world. I refuse to accept the idea that to solve one problem, we have to create another. The Democrats propose uh, writing the Ryan Republican budget wrong by taxing oil company profits. Therefore, their suggestion that we go from a 34 percent interest to 6.8 can be paid for out of the wealth of oil companies that benefit from our country so tremendously. Mr. Speaker, I reject the blackmail inherent in H.R. 4628. I don't uh, want anybody to know that uh, it's okay to pit one group against another and we cannot undermine health care to pay for education, we have to do the right thing, and we have to choose both. I yield back. Expired. Gentlelady from Illinois, continue to reserve. Yes, I continue to reserve. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'd like to recognize and yield time one minute to the gentleman from California, Ms. Davis. Gentlelady from Davis. California, it's recognized for one minute. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, unless college acts, Congress acts, Stafford loan rates will double. I spoke to some students at San Diego State University just the other day worried about their day-to-day -day needs, and they asked us not to play politics with this issue. New grads should have increased opportunities, not bills they can't pay. A college degree should invite calls from job recruiters, not from collection agencies. I'm glad that the majority has abruptly changed course by agreeing to stop this interest rate hike, but it is unacceptable that this bill proposes to pay for this by repealing the prevention fund. The bill creates a choice between funding cancer screening for a mother or making college more affordable for her daughter. Would you want to be that mother? That sends the wrong message to the American people about our priorities. I urge my colleagues to support a more equitable solution that promotes the health of the American families and the future of our bright minds. I yield back. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, I would ask the, uh, the, the gentleman uh, how many, uh, does he have more members? We at least five more speakers. Okay, then I would continue to reserve. Gentlelady reserve, gentleman from Massachusetts. At this time, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Clark, for one minute. Gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. I want to thank the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for yielding me time. You know, we've talked about the cost of capping student loan interest rates. Well, I think we should extend the cap for longer than a year, and we don't need to cut people's health care screenings in order to do it. Let's create jobs. That's how we can create the economic revenue. And one of the best ways for us to create jobs is to allow student loan borrowers the ability to pay down on their loans according to their income for 10 years and then making them eligible to have the balance of their student loans, if they only be forgiven. That's the best economic stimulus. You know, these loans are not just for the benefit of the borrower. It also makes our country stronger. The more our people are trained and educated, we can sell the best products overseas and create the best technology. That creates jobs for this country. It's in our national interest to help pay down these debts and forgive certain student loans. Let's redirect some of our money from Afghanistan and Iraq and use the savings to forgive student loans. I yield back my time. Gentlemen, time has expired. Gentlelady from Illinois. Continue to reserve, Mr. Speaker. Gentlelady reserves. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to yield one minute to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Engel. Gentleman from New York is recognized for one minute. Well, you know, once again, uh, the Republican leadership has shown that it's more interested in playing political games than it is in getting things done. Um, we're talking about student loans here. We should be putting our heads together 
in coming up with a better way to pay for lowering student loan rates, not uh, eviscerating uh, health care prevention. This is uh, nothing more than a cynical ploy. You know, the American people want us to work together. We have an opportunity to do this. This is what we really should be doing. There are lots of loopholes that we could close. My colleagues have mentioned big oil and, and, and big gas. We could close those loopholes. We have corporations making lots of money. We could close those loopholes. But what do the Republicans decide to do? They decide to hurt health benefits. They decide to hurt prevention benefits. This is not the way uh, we should be going. We need to put our heads together and help these students. The Democrats have said time and time again that this is our priority. We have voted against Republican budgets that raise the amount that students have to pay in loans. Stop playing your cynical games and let's get to work for the American people. Let's put our heads together, let's help these students, and let's not eviscerate a health prevention. I yield back. Gentleman's time has expired. Does the gentlelady continue to reserve? Continue to reserve. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time I'd like to recognize and yield to the gentleman from Michigan. One minute, Mr. Peters. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, today I rise in opposition to H.R. 4628, a misguided, deeply partisan bill which would cut $6 billion from the Prevention and Public Health Fund. For months I have been proud to help lead the charge to prevent student loan rates from doubling on July 1st. So please excuse my surprise when I hear the majority talk about their strong support for keeping college loans affordable. This is a position that they have repeatedly rejected. Apparently Republicans have no interest in trying to prevent serious diseases. Surely if Republicans can ram a $46 billion tax cut to millionaires and billionaires, they can find a way to pay for both education and health care. I urge my colleagues to vote for defeat of this bill, stop protecting tax giveaways to big oil, and pass a responsible bill to stop the doubling of student loan rates. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, Mr. Speaker, at this time I would like to enter uh, into the record uh, several documents. One is from the American Council on Education, uh, representing uh, 37 uh, education associations uh, and they, they say uh, ed education has never been as important uh, to America's economy health as it is now. That's where you're encouraging, encouraged by the proposals we have seen. The administration both parties have expected strong support for keeping the interest rate at 3.4 percent without cutting other forms <coughs> of student aid. Enter that. Another one is from uh, uh, Lewis University uh, in Illinois uh, saying uh, Doubling the interest in the uh, subsidized Stafford loans will discourage students in need, in need who are striving to continue their degree study during these difficult economic times. Thank you for your support for these students. And finally, from uh, Joliet Junior College, uh, saying uh, that the college has uh, uh, serves a population of seven counties in Illinois. Uh, last uh, in 20. 2010-2011 school year, uh, junior college students were awarded over $23 million in total financial aid. Uh, because of this, the institution supports H.R. 4628 legislation that would pre uh, prevent the scheduled rake height. And with that, I would reserve the, my time. Without objection, the uh, reference material will be entered into the record. The gentlelady continues to reserve. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As long as we think you need consent to enter onto the record, uh, materials on that. I'd like to enter in uh, letters from groups opposing the Republican Bill, H.R. 4628, the American Federation of Teachers, the American Diabetes Association, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, the American Lung Association, the American Public Health Association, the Campaign for America's Future, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, the National Partnership for Women and Families, Demores, AFL-CIO, SEIU, Trust for America's Health, USSA, Young Invincibles, Campus Prog uh, Progress, USSA, US Perg, Young Invincibles, National Partnership for Women and Families, American Lung Association, Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, American Public Health Association, and uh, Mr. Speaker, some 760 uh, groups that support the Prevention and Public Health Fund. Thank you. With that, I'd like to yield one minute to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. The gentleman from Vermont is recognized for one minute. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week the Republican majority 
was adamantly opposed to this le legislation. This week, we're rushing it through on the floor today. You know what? That's a good thing. We're on the same page. The majority and the minority want to preserve student interest rates at 3.4 percent, not let them double to 6.8 percent. So if that is the case, why are we selecting mutually unacceptable ways to pay for this? It's as though we're resorting to the trick bags. You raid the health fund that's so important to us. We present the oil company a provision that is so unacceptable to you. What we should do is find a way to put some limits, some incentives to keep tuition increases at or below the rate of inflation. They were up 8.4 percent. If we work together, that would be a double win for students and parents. We could keep those interest rates low and we could start bringing down the escalation in tuition increases that are unacceptable. I yield back. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, I, I reserve the balance. Gentlelady reserve. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, at this time I'd like to uh, yield one minute to the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. Gentleman from Rhode Island is recognized for one minute. Without objection. I'd like to thank the uh, gentleman from Massachusetts for yielding for his outstanding uh, leadership on this issue and so many other issues in, in education. Mr. Speaker, we obviously absolutely cannot allow the interest rate on student loans to more than uh, double. And I rise in opposition to H.R. 4628. While Congress must prevent the Stafford loan interest rate from doubling to 6.8 percent, it is unconscionable that Republican leadership is forcing us to choose between education and health care. Now, too many students face unnecessary barriers to pursuing a college degree, and it is our responsibility to empower them by investing in their education and health. Republicans are putting us in the untenable position of paying for this measure by gutting the Prevention and Public Health Fund, the sole purpose of which is to reduce chronic conditions that are driving up the cost of health care in the first place. Now, instead of sacrificing our public health to score political points, we need to work together to ensure our students can pursue their dreams without the burdens of unnecessary costs and debt. I, have, I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, is the uh, uh, gentleman uh, ready to close? We have one more speaker to close. That's correct. Does the gentlewoman have any more speakers? No. So I'll, okay. the gentleman. All right. If you'll yield, then the... the uh, There's a gentlelady reserve. I reserve. Gentlelady reserves her time. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Mr. Speaker, at this time I yield the remaining time on this side to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Van Holland. Gentleman from Maryland is recognized for one minute. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my friend from Massachusetts. Just a few weeks ago on this very floor, our Republican colleagues voted for the Republican budget that called for a doubling of interest rates on student loans on seven million American students, and they voted against the Democratic alternative budget, which would have prevented that increase in student loan interest rates. So what's happened over the last couple of weeks? Well, President Obama has gone to the country, he's gone to students, and he's told the story about what the Republican budget would do, and so we are here today. But make no mistake, Mr. Speaker, our Republican colleagues haven't changed their minds about this. They've changed their tactics. If they really wanted to prevent student loans from increasing, they wouldn't seek to cover the costs by cutting funds for cervical cancer screening, by cutting funds for breast cancer screening, by cutting other women's health care measures. They wouldn't push a measure the President has already said he would veto. Mr. Speaker, we have a proposal. Let's cover the costs by getting rid of the subsidies for big oil companies. That's the real slush fund around here. Are the big taxpayer subsidies go for that purpose? Let's get the job done, uh, and let's not play political games. Unfortunately, what we're seeing here, Mr. Speaker, uh, is an effort to seek political cover. Uh, let's get the job done for real. Thank you. Mr. Gentlelady from Illinois. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentlelady is recognized. Uh, to close, uh, you know, it seems like came in and I think the first thing that I talked about here is how I hope that we would be able to to work together on a bipartisan basis 
Uh, it just seems like this uh, is, is so hard to do uh, in this uh, political uh, time, and I just, uh, I really think that, you know, in, in major uh, legislation, we really have to work together to, uh, to make, to find the solutions. Uh, but it seems like the other side is always ready to tell us what we think and what we are doing and why we are doing it. We are doing this because we really want to uh, have our, our students have the ability to have a quality education. And it just seems like we're so different on, on the pay-fors. I know that everybody agrees on, the, on the, uh, the program itself and how we have to do it. But we can't seem to do anything without uh, giving us a, a cynical view, and I, it, it bothers me. Uh, it seems like when we were talking about uh, the pay for us, uh, the other side of the aisle's first reaction is, uh, is to uh, raise taxes for everything. And ours has always been to reduce spending, and we think that this is the way to go. I think we have just got to find a way to get together, and I had said, uh, in my opening statement that I hope that we would be able to get together and work together and I uh, also the Senate and I hope that when this bill goes over to the Senate that there is uh, a negotiation that there is a conference and so that we really can iron this out and make sure that that uh, there is not a, 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 a raising of the, uh, the to the 6.38 percent it's, it kind of makes you wonder. Um, it just seems like the the, uh, the political maneuvering uh, certainly is, is continuing on uh, on the student loan issues. And uh, I guess uh, today, when we have this vote, uh, we'll see what happens. But I, I really hope that when we we get to the Senate, so that we have the opportunity to do this. I know that uh, Ms. Uh, and I just want to go back a little bit to uh, what, was, what happened in the Education Committee uh, yesterday, uh, Ms. Roby talked about, and so did Mr. Tierney, that I think that uh, the uh, Secretary uh, Sebelius uh, did say that uh, there were services uh, outside the Prevention and Public Health Fund uh, that will remain uh, available to in individuals who, sue, who seek preventive uh, care, such as cancer prevention and care, including breast and cervical cancer screenings, uh, screenings for birth defects and, and developmental disabilities, tobacco prevention at, at the CDC, and efforts uh, that promote healthy nutrition and physical a uh, activity to present, prevent uh, obesity. So I think that this really uh, is a lot that we believe in for uh, prevention. And we heard from Mr. Stearns all of the uh, appropriations and how that uh, takes care of a lot of the prevention, uh, prevention issues. And I think that this whole uh, American people are really uh, very uh, knowledgeable now about prevention and what they need to do and have the uh, uh, ability to do this on their own as well. So uh, I hope that, that this... Uh, this political bickering uh, is, is not what the bill is all about. What the bill is all about is to uh, reduce to 3 4 percent uh, the interest rates on the, uh, on the subsidized Strat, uh, Stratford loans. And I hope that, uh, that this bill will pass. I urge my colleagues to, to vote for it, and I uh, would then uh, yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back her time. All time for debate has expired. Pursuant to House Resolution 631, the previous question is ordered on the bill. The question is on engrossment and third reading of the bill. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Third reading. A bill to extend student loan interest rates for undergraduate federal direct Stafford loans. Pursuant to Clause 1C of Rule 19, further consideration of H.R. 4628, is postponed. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the vote on the motion by the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, to suspend the rules and pass H.R. 2096 as amended, on which the yeas and nays are ordered. The clerk will report the title of the bill. H.R. 2096, a bill to advance cybersecurity research development and technical standards and for other purposes. The question, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote.
So the House holding their first and only series of votes on the day right now. Four votes beginning with a suspension bill dealing with cybersecurity research. After that, they'll debate a procedural motion related to the student loan interest rate bill that they've been debating, extending lower federally subsidized student loans for another year. We are anticipating a vote on final passage of that bill after that. And then a vote on another technology bill dealing with computer networking. And that should wrap up legislative business for the week in the House. Members will then begin a week-long break. So while this vote is underway, remarks now from a number of House Democratic women, led by Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. They held a briefing a short time ago to discuss the student loan legislation and the Violence Against Women bill that was passed in the Senate yesterday. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today on the floor of the House, we will be taking up legislation relating to the interest rates paid by students and their families on student loans. Uh, all Americans, I think, agree that the best investment a family and a nation can make is in the education uh, of our children uh, for their own self-fulfillment, but also for the competitiveness of our nation. Uh, for this reason, in 2007, the Democratic majority uh, in the Congress passed legislation that would ratchet down the interest rates that students pay on their loans. It passed in a strong bipartisan way. 77 Republicans voted for it. President Bush signed the legislation. Uh, now that is expiring, and last week in their budget, uh, the Republicans overwhelmingly voted to allow the 6.8 percent interest rates uh, to, com to uh, come forth. Democrats in our budget said no, we have to offset that and have uh, continue the 3.4 percent interest rates. This makes a very big difference around the kitchen table of America's families. Uh, the Republicans lost patience with the idea uh, that, that we should be reducing the, uh, the interest rates paid for by students and expressed their dismay. President Obama took the issue to the public explaining why and how, what the difference this makes in terms of the obligation and the burden that would be on America's families. Apparently he made the issue too hot for the Republicans to handle because now today they are saying, okay, uh, we will uh, pr postpone the increase in interest rates uh, for one year by bringing a bill to the floor. By bringing a bill to the floor that says, we will do this but we will only reduce the interest rates by making, a, making an, an assault on women's health, a continuation of their assault on women's health. Uh, just before we came to this press availability, the president issue, issued a veto threat. The administration issued a statement of administration policy which said that if the president is prevented, presented with H.R. 4628, his seniors would recommend he veto the bill. And the reason why is because this, this prevention fund from which they want to take the money is very important to women's health. Uh, here to tell us why is the ranking Democrat on the Health and Human Services Subcommittee of Appropriations, the uh, co-chair of our Steering and Policy Committee, member of the leadership, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Good morning. I want to say thank you to the leader and proud to join with my colleagues here this morning, Congresswoman uh, Maloney, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, and Congresswoman Gwen, Gwen Moore. Uh, essentially, what the Republican majority would do is to eliminate all of the funding for the Prevention and Public Health Fund. What is the Public Health, the Prevention and Public Health Fund? It provides critical health services. Uh, as it says, to prevent illness. Uh, now, it's, it's provided to all Americans, uh, and including women uh, and children. Let us get to the important issues that face women. We would prevent screenings for breast and cervical cancer. Their action right now. That would be the action that they would undertake if this fund is eliminated. In addition to that, uh, this fund helps to prevent coronary heart disease. And that is the leading killer of women in America. It mitigates osteoporosis, 
arthritis, mental illness, which disproportionately affect women in the United States. If you take a look at children, the fund provides access to immunization. And in terms of prevention, we know that you save, for every dollar spent, you're saving $16 in healthcare costs. In addition to which, this fund would work to prevent birth defects and developmental disabilities. It has a profound effect on what is happening with women's health. You couple this with what they did in last month's budget and their assault on women and with the repeal of the health care bill you would see that in fact women would pay more for their coverage than men and their preventive health services would go uncovered without insurance. Medicare would be ended as we know it, shifting the cost to seniors. Medicaid is, is shifted to states and in fact what that does is slash benefits for seniors. Now I mentioned those programs because in fact and uh, excuse me gentlemen, women outlive men. Medicare, Medicaid are critical issues for women in this nation. Now what the majority would do today with taking the funds here, instead of taking it from special interest and closing corporate loopholes, was to just pile on on that assault on women's health care. Thanks, ma'am. Thank it's important to note that in our democratic proposal that we have put forth, uh, we, take the, we pay for this uh, sustaining of the 3.4 percent, uh, avoiding the increase to 6.8 percent, uh, but offsetting the cost uh, by eliminating some of the subsidies on, oil, uh, on the oil industry. The Republicans have said, we'll never do that. It's women and children first with us. We're going to assault their initiative in the prevention fund. And so it's, it's important to make that distinction as well. The, um, uh, the other point of this is, as Congresswoman DeLauro said, this is part of many things, including uh, the issue of, of uh, birth control and comp contraception that we have seen along the way. I applaud the President, uh, the administration, uh, for their statement because it clearly spells out the importance of this prevention fund. And I'll make one other further point. As a sink, uh, if you need no other indication of how opposed they are to this prevention fund for women's health, you need, even, you need only note that they only need a piece of it. If they were saying, well, we want to pay for it from the women's fund, too bad, that's our priority, to pay for the women's fund. But they don't do that. They say we're going to pay for it from the women's fund, and the remaining billions of dollars that would be left in the prevention fund were repealing. We're just eliminating that. Hundreds of thousands of people have been screened, are being screened each year now already uh, in this legislation. Grants to states are being made. That would all stop. My colleague, Congresswoman uh, Carolyn Maloney, has made the point where are the women when the Republicans uh, uh, had their hearing on women's health and women, a woman uh, that we had suggested wasn't qualified, just these five men to talk about women's health. Our colleague, Congresswoman uh, Gwen Moore, was with us and many of you were there when uh, she took the lead on the Violence Against Women's Act, advocating for that, which passed overwhelmingly in a bipartisan way in the Senate yesterday, and we're happy about that. And Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has been a champion on children's issues and women's issues, and children are very affected by that. Imagine to, re uh, to eliminate the fund that does the immunizations when every child's immunization is important to every other child in America. It's a false economy to think uh, that we're saving money or keeping our own kids healthy if we deprive other children of immunization. One last point before we hear your questions is that nothing, nothing brings more to the federal treasury than the education of the American people. Early childhood, K through 12, higher education, 
uh, the postgraduate, lifetime learning, it all brings money to the Treasury. Uh, so to say uh, that we're going to go down this path this one year and take the money from women's health, uh, inching our way down the path, is simply wrong. With that, would my colleagues stand ready to join me in taking any... Oh, Congresswoman Laura Richardson uh, from California has joined us as well. Yes, sir. Senator Boehner has pointed out that there's a precedent for, for taking money from this fund. If, if, if this fund is so important, why was $4 million or $5 million taken out as a bargaining chip in the uh, payroll tax? Good question. And all the more reason why we shouldn't be taking any more money out of it. We weren't happy uh, that that was the only way uh, that they would agree to the payroll tax reduction. But the fact is, some money has already been taken out, all the more reason to leave the rest of the money in. And again, I call your attention to the fact that they don't only take out what they need, they want to eliminate the fund. They tried to do that in December. We stopped them then. Why do you feel that they keep going back on health care? Obviously, there are many in their party who don't like the health care law. Do you view this as pure politics? They said, well, if we can stick it to, stick it to the health care law in, in some other way, do you view it in that frame? No, I view it as a statement of their values. In their budget, they make it clear, as Congresswoman DeLauro said, they want to end the Medicare guarantee. They want seniors to pay more as the Medicare guarantee is is terminated, seniors to pay more in the meantime, perhaps $6,400 more each year, as they give over $400,000 tax break to people making over a million dollars a year. But I'm going to yield to Congressman Maloney. She may want to say something about that issue. It's interesting that uh, the fund they keep going back to is one that particularly benefits, it benefits men too, but it particularly benefits uh, the uh, reproductive uh, health care, childbearing health care, preventive health care that is so necessary to women. And I would say it's another example with the President's veto why the President has a 15 to 20 point uh, gender gap advantage uh, because of his actions like today, standing up for women, children, and I'd say all Americans. And uh, the Republicans have an 18-point gender gap. I would say they have worked very hard to earn that gender gap. Uh, bit by bit, vote by vote, bill by bill, defund by defund, and insult by insult. And we will continue to ask the question, where are the women? And we'd like the women to be in the budget with the special needs that we have for preventive health care. Preventive health care actually saves money in the long run. If you can prevent cancer, if you can prevent some type of disease or some type of anything, then, then you're really investing not only in the health of the individual but the health of the, of the country. Uh, so we will continue to look to see, find women at all tables and uh, treated equally at all tables and with proper funding for their health care. I'm leader. Yes. I want um, to ask say yes, ma'am. Address the fact that this is happening at the same time that the reauthorization of the is happening. Republicans say that they are trying to make changes to the bill, as some of their colleagues did in the Senate and then they plan to do in the House, that they say, you know, are, are making this debate needlessly critical, uh, that, that um, you know, funding. You know what? I, I, I get your point. Yes. The point is that on the floor of this House at this time, on this day, the Republicans have folded because the President made the issue too hot to handle. That is why the bill is coming to the floor today. It has to come up soon because by July, by July uh, the interest rates will double. But the reason that it's happening in the same week as the Violence Against Women Act uh, passed in the Senate is because they folded, they felt the heat of the president going out there and saying we have to, we cannot allow 3.4 to go to 6.8 uh, for families trying to send their kids to college. So the timing is their folding. I'm going to yield on the Violence Against Women Act to the sponsor in the House of the Violence Against Women Act, the co-chair of the uh, Women's Caucus, Congresswoman Gwen Moore. I think the uh, Senate passed uh, by wide margin, 68 to 31, I believe, uh, a, a reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act that uh, had all the elements in it uh, based on best practices to include um, provisions that 
help all women, uh, despite their uh, immigration status, uh, despite their uh, gender uh, or sexual orientation, and in particular uh, to provide uh, jurisdiction on native, uh, on tribal lands, where 52% of the assaults, sexual assaults that are committed on tribal lands uh, go uh, without any uh, uh, retribution uh, because the tribal lands don't have any authority. We think that that bill ought to be brought up uh, in that form. Uh, and again, this, this is a very gendered institution, the Congress, and I think that the, the inability to bring forth that bill here in the House, this is another example of the gender bias uh, against women, uh, when we look at the at this health care fund that they want to gouge, uh, it's because health care is one of the issues that women most care about. It has a, a, a greater impact on them, whether you're talking about Medicare, Medicaid, uh, food stamps, uh, women, uh, 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 student loans, Pell Grants, no matter what you talk about, all these programs that are being gouged in our budget are disproportionately uh, being used by women. And this is just one more example. This the Violence Against Women Act, where we are seeing the, the sheer gender bias in this institution against meeting women's needs. So we hope that they bring forth the Senate bill and not their so-called clean <laughs> bill, um, because they don't want to sully their hands with dealing with, uh, with women who are in the shadows and, and make immigrant women more invisible, um, uh, those women who are uh, lesbians and are victims of uh, violent uh, crimes, and of course um, uh, 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 those women who uh, find themselves uh, in, in uh, you know, facing uh, all kind of violence. We don't want that gender bias um, uh, uh, to prevail in their version of VAWA. I just wanted to be sure that the congresswoman, she's preaching to us all the time, that many of the uh, uh, kids who take, who take advantage of student loans also need this prevention. Uh, so uh, uh, we, it's a, it's a, a, a difficult, diff, uh, it's like they rub two stones together and they're playing with fire. They ought not to do it. This prevention uh, saves lives, saves money, and there certainly are plenty other places to go in the budget. For example, there are tax breaks for the wealthiest people in America. As we do in our bill, they're to eliminate some of the subsidies that they have for big oil in their, uh, in their budget and in their priority system. What we're saying here today is stop your assault on women this be depleting, not just using it for the uh, uh, student loan issue, but to go beyond that and say we're eliminating the funding for the prevention fund, uh, the source of much of the resources that the CDC uses for public health and prevention. It's just plain wrong. We salute the president for taking the message to the public in such a strong way, again, making it too hot for the Republicans to handle. Unfortunately, they came back uh, with what seemed natural to them. Let's take the money out of women's health rather than big subsidies to big oil. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Thank you. A briefing of, from about uh, two hours ago, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi and her colleagues in the House will begin a week-long break at the end of the legislative day today. Members will return Monday, May 7th with the Senate. The Senate, by the way, expected to begin their uh, debate on a student loan bill, very similar to the House bill except for the funding. And you can see the Senate live when they return on C-SPAN 2. In the House right now, a vote on one of two computer and technology-related bills dealing with cybersecurity research and technical standards. Up next, debate on a procedural motion related to the student loan bill.
On this vote, the A's are 395, the nays are 10. Two thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The bill is passed. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Pursuant to Clause 1C of Rule 19, further consideration of H.R. 4628 will now resume. The clerk will report the title. H.R. 4628, a bill to extend student loan interest rates for undergraduate federal direct Stafford loans.